Over a month ago, the Federal Drug Administration gave the green light to Pfizer's coronavirus vaccine, which in trials was found to be 95% effective against the virus. To get more background on how Pfizer was able to come up with a vaccine so quickly, I'm joined by my first guest and my friend, Dr. Michael Nolston, the chief scientific officer at Pfizer, the president of Worldwide Medical Research for Pfizer. Michael, great to see you. Look, I just want to tell the audience, I talked to you early on. When I got obsessed with what was going to go on before many people, I called you, said, would you do the coronavirus report? You told us you hadn't even done the deal with BioNTech did. We were on the front end. You jumped in this fast. Tell us about that. Steve, thank you for the opportunity here. And it's clear that you are among the pioneers in uh, bringing the idea to the table that we need to do something fast. And at Pfizer, we had a legacy of being a company with capabilities end to end, from the laboratory to the clinic to manufacturing for billions of people. And that allowed us to take a decision to be a major contributor in the battle against COVID-19. And of course, we feel very proud now with all our collaborators uh, from uh, best practice sharing with NIH to FDA and all the patients that participated that in 10, 10 months, we were able to go to have a, have a vaccine and the EUA that's now rolled out in the United States with this uh, great efficacy. And we're thrilled by the view of, um, I heard from previous speaker, seeing maybe uh, 300 million Americans vaccinated by the mid of this year to win the first of the battles with maybe a lengthy war with the coronavirus. Well, let me ask you, uh, part of my obsession is, is science saving us again? In a little while, we're going to have Anthony Fauci. We're going to have Francis Collins, who led the Human Genome Project. And I guess I've been waiting to see what we've done in the last 10 years, you know, genomic uh, research and advances and others, whether or not there's going to be finally a payoff. Is this the first big payoff, you know, when we see CRISPR and other things that are out there that we've been able to now you know, change time and space in, in not only vaccines, but a whole range of other things. This is the first practical moment where all of that investment, these technological leaps, have made a fundamental difference in science. I think, Steve, we have seen many more uh, focused payoffs in the areas of cancer, in the genetic medicine. But this is the number one payout for patients across the globe. Never before have we been able to capitalize from those two decades of progress in genetic and genomics and in new technology to design, in this case, a vaccine based on mRNA. It's basically the code of the virus that we repurposed from its evil impact to something really good. And it turns out that I think it gives us not just the first big win here, but also gives us the promise that this technology that is so fast, that is synthetic, contains no foreign particles, can be used again and again to come back and hit the virus as we start to see that either immune levels over time may fade and we need to boost them, or we see that the virus try to evade by mutating. So I feel so good about this new technology that indeed comes from the genomic revolution can be applied to uh, basically save the world as we used to look at it. Look, we're short on time, which is always a challenge in this, but you've got one of the smartest brains I know. Um, And I, I hesitate when we do an event like this, which, you know, the story is turning out to be promising, major promises. I want the audience to understand science is not always sure shots. Pfizer put billions of dollars down. You didn't know you were going to get paid. There are risks involved. There are flops and failures. Can you tell us just a little bit, you know, in, in language that I can understand about wrong turns, things, the tension of finding, you know, an answer in this virus and this vaccine in such a short period of time that gives us a sense of the trade-offs because there are risks involved. Yeah, you're right. It was a very large amount of investment in dollars and in the staff that are all involved in battling diseases. And, uh, you know, I thought our CEO, Albert Bola, was uh, really courageous when directing us to put in everything we have of experience of technology. Now we got a bit of a springboard because we have been working with BioNTech on mRNA 
technologies for two years trying to bat the flu. So we could use that to make a leap. And there were many turns that uh, were challenging. Should we go to the left and to the right? One of them were obviously late July when we had data on several of our vaccine options and had to make a at-risk decision, pick one in or order to keep the momentum. And it turned out that we made the right choice based on, I think, good judgment and a little bit of intuition that helps. And of course, to put this uh, large effort in manufacturing also paid off. And you have heard that we have just stated that we will see about 2 billion doses being available in 2021, a substantial portion for the first five months in the United States. And that's an amazing payout from the time, the around the clock efforts and the dollars at risk. And we feel very good about that. Of course, it's all underpinned by the data. If we wouldn't have had this very high efficacy, I don't think we would have been able to feel that uh, timeline by mid of the year to turn this battle into a win would have been possible. But Steve, again, the importance now is not just to be complacent once we have rolled this up. Right. We need to continue to do surveillance and we need to be prepared to reload our vaccination with a boost, with an upgraded vaccine, maybe right. in one to two years. Michael, we've got Dr. Anthony Fauci waiting, so I've got to shift in, but I want to ask you just very briefly, what is the state of cooperation in science today among competing companies, you know, and, 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 and competing nations? And, you know, is it, is it healthy or are you concerned that, that some of the dynamics that folks look at of, you know, Moderna versus Pfizer versus this company versus that or vaccine nationalism continue to be things you should worry about? Are, are we better off or worse off? I think uh, this pandemic has brought us all together. You know, you feel very good being American that we have two of the leading edge companies, you mentioned Moderna and the Pfizer Alliance, being at the frontier here. Right. And, you know, I really want to acknowledge the many great conversations we have had with Tony Fauci and Francis Collins that have brought all best yeah. views to the table. Now, if we are right. to win big against the virus, yeah. we also need to look upon it as a global battle because right. the virus is not just going to be present in the United States. It will continue to evolve across the globe. Right. And we are welcoming really a global task force Right. to stay on top, stay ahead of the curve of, of this virus, and we can win. Michael Dolston of Pfizer, you've done incredible things. It was an honor to talk to you at the beginning, early on, as I did with Dr. Anthony Fauci as well. Thank you so much for all the work you're doing and joining us Thank today. Thank you, Steve. You're an honorary member in our team. Thank you.